Hello, welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I don't have any fillings. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss The Thing from 2011. <laughs> Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis for The Thing? Well, the story follows a group of Swedish scientists. <clears throat> Norwegian. Norwegian scientists who have just uncovered an alien signal underneath the ice in Antarctica. A group of American scientists are taken there to study this alien creature that they find and the creature escapes and starts to assimilate the scientists one by one. Now, I, I'm trying to recall how I even felt when I found out that they were making another Thing movie. Because when they said, back along, we're making a Thing video game based on John Carpenter's work, yeah. super excited because yeah. it continued the story and it opened up the universe just a little bit more and you could yes. see lots of different creatures and designs. And But when it comes to the film, I was just like, you really shouldn't fucking do that. Because no. John Carpenter is a master of horror and the Thing is my favourite in the genre. Yeah. It is absolutely fantastic so why why bother why touch it why potentially ruin it and the original filmmakers and universal studios were like yeah we'll just remake it it's fine you know john carpenter's film is a remake so we'll just remake his yeah will we get john carpenter involved nah yeah. we're universal studios we own it it's not john carpenter's movie it's ours yeah we don't need kurt russell we don't even need anything connected to the and to that film we could just do whatever. And so they, they were just going to remake it. And so the producers that were hired to remake the film just went, hey, hey, wait, 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 wait. Fans are already getting wind of this and getting a bit upset. So how about we just do the prequel? Because that story is kind of, it's there. Yeah. You know, it, in our, in fans of John Carpenter's The Thing's imagination, we've painted the picture already of what happened in that Norwegian base. Yeah. But I guess watching it play out could be interesting. I was apprehensive uh, and excited at the same time. You know, when they said they were going to remake the film, I was like, no, no, you're not. You know, it, even if you, even if you do, it's going to be fucking terrible. Just hands down. And then when they said they were making a prequel to talk about the camp, I was like, oh. Ooh, now I now I'm in now I'm interested because in a way you're not touching John Carpenter's the thing you are dabbling yes dabbling uh, but you are not even uh, connecting it to any of the characters you know we have Mary Elizabeth Winstead playing Kate Lloyd now she is for me the Ripley of the thing series yeah she's not McCready's daughter she's not his sister or his auntie or anybody who's even closely related to him there's even no information that there's an American camp nearby said in this That in does this annoy me a little bit because they mention a Russian camp which is nearby. Well, you know, would these people know about each other? I'm pretty would they sure they wouldn't? would know about the different research stations oh, in the oh, Antarctic. Okay, calm down. <laughs> calm down. You know, yeah, I pick one thread. This guy completely pulls it all apart. Ready, ready. You're ready. <laughs> but... I went into this film when I saw it in the cinema. I paid money to go see it in the cinema and I was ready. I had a pen and a notepad. <laughs> I had a fucking burning torch and a pitchfork and a, and you know, I had my sign ready with the paint to say good film or bad film. I was ready to burn that motherfucker down if I didn't get what I wanted. But I didn't know what I wanted. I just knew that there were certain things that had to be in this Norwegian camp for McCready to go to there in John Carpenter's movie and they had to be there. We had to have a two-faced monster lying outside in the snow, burnt. We had to have half a camp destroyed. We had to have an axe in the wall and a man who'd slit his wrists. We had to have a giant ice cube that had been, looked like something had broken out of it. And we had to have two Norwegians chasing a dog in a helicopter. That's all I wanted. Everything else was just just tacked on top. So when the film starts and we are introduced to these characters, like I said, we've got Mary Elizabeth Winstead playing Kate Lloyd. She is a, a scientist who studies 
carbon dating, I think. Is carbon dating, you well, know... Apparently she's supposed to be doing an autopsy on a frozen animal. Yeah. Which I think was supposed to be a bear. It's hard to tell what sort of yeah. creature it is. And then when I looked it up, apparently that was a prop from John Carpenter's The Thing. It was one of the dog props. It looks like a dog. But and I'm so like, what is... then I'm just like, wait a minute. How is she expe- How is she doing an autopsy on a dog thing? From no, no, wait. No, it's, no, just, it's, no, it's, it's supposed it's, to be. It's, it's just. It's just a prop. So why use the prop from the? Because it, it's supposed to connect it. Shh, 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 shh. So she's a carbon data, and she has been hired by Sander Halverson, played by Ulrich Thompson, to come to the Norwegian camp and to uh, carbon date this thing that they found in the ice. Now Halverson, you just don't like. He's got one of those faces. The way he treats people, the way he talks to people, you, I, personally, want him flamethrowered as soon as they get the flamethrower. He, uh, he was a great villain on a TV show called Banshee. Really? Uh, he, just a great villain, you know, just a, one of those suits that you just love to hate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. He's, he, when he stands in that room just looking at Kate and he's just like, yes, I hear you do this and that, um, we're, we're leaving and uh, you can come or whatever. And I'm like, oh, fuck it. You could... Mary Elizabeth Winstead, she delivers it very well. Like, who is this guy? And you have to remember, even though the film was released in 2011, it's set in 1982. Well, in that case, there's a lot of things that don't add up. Like, the headphones that she's wearing wouldn't have been around by then. They're Walkmans. Yeah, but they wouldn't have had those type of headphones. Really? Uh, there's a scene later on where one of the Norwegians is playing a... A, a ukulele? A ukulele, which didn't come around until late 2000s. Really? Yeah. A ukulele's been around, I mean... Look it up. All right, well, well, you know, these things are in the background. But I like to remember it's in 1982 because we're going into John Carpenter's movie straight after this. The Norwegian camp. Now, it's expanded. It's bigger than what we see in John Carpenter's movie. And there are a hell of a lot more personnel than we even see in the next movie. But I, I, I love it. I, I think... love the whole, that setup. Especially, like I said, we skipped over it. The beginning when they're in the snowcat and they're just going along. And you can hear that weird transmission. Uh, as soon as I hear that transmission, it's as good as seeing that ship fly down in John Carpenter's. I hear that weird transmission and I'm like, don't go near it. Don't touch it. Leave it where it is. Don't investigate it. And of course, the ice gives way underneath them and they get trapped down there. And that is how they discover the crashed UFO. Yeah. And so going back to what you were saying about the building of the Norwegian camp was yeah. that they had no notes from the John Carpenter film as no. to the scale, the size, the locations. And so on the set, literally plastered everywhere were pictures from the John Carpenter movie yes. so that they could match everything exactly. They also used their scale method was how tall is Kurt Russell? He's this tall, right. which means that everything now needs to be at this height because that is the height it is when Kurt Russell comes to the Norwegian camp. Yes. So, you know, they yes. had lots of little tricks and tips that they did. And, you know, I've got to give it to the special effects team in this remake. They did a phenomenal job at imitating what came before it. Yes. And this is what I mean. I mean, I, I always talk about this film with people and they're like, oh, how could you like that? It's because of the attention to detail that they had. They had John Carpenter's film to go from and had to make up their own stuff for things that they didn't know about. And if you look at John Carpenter's film, they do not spend that much time in the Norwegian camp. They, no. Copper and McCready literally go there, walk into a couple of rooms, and then they head back. And then they go out to the alien ship. So having this camp, in my mind, I'm like, none of you are going to survive. Well, but, that's the, that is one of the caveats of knowing, but it, watching but, this film, that none of them are going to survive. But for me, and this might sound weird, for me, that's a good thing. But then you also know that one of the characters, at least, or two of them have to survive to be in the helicopter at the end. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so I love the next movie so much that... Like I said, I was ready to rip this one apart. But as I got further into the film, I was finding it more enjoyable. It was giving me just enough to keep me watering at the mouth. Like, so I get to watch John Carpenter's The Thing after this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, here. 
Just a little bit more, Ian. Just a little bit more. So, so here's the creature out in the ice. Oh, wow. Wow. That's just, that, that's like when they come to it in the next movie and the whole thing. Yeah, but it's not taken out. We've got to take it out first. So it's still in the ice. Yes. And you look in the ice and I love the fact that when you look into the ice, it, you look like you can guess what it is, but then you also cannot tell what it is. This you thing just, has it, it no look, shape. It looks like a bug from Starship Troopers frozen in the ice. It's definitely insect in, form. Yeah, insect form. I, I mean, I take that because there's a few insect-like moments in John Carpenter's that they go with. But yeah. it's like it's got a form and then it has no form. Right. This thing looks absolutely fucking viciously aggressive and we should burn it straight away. <laughs> no, we need to sample right now. Yeah, yeah. Do you really think that's a good idea? Yes, I do. Halverson and, and the rest of the Norwegians take the ice block back to their base. And I love that unsettling feeling you have as the Americans. I mean, Now, I know that the Carter character, played by Joel Edgerton, and the Jameson character, the American pilots, are kind of like your... Hey, look, it's the Americans, like in the next movie kind of thing. And one of them's a pilot. Ooh. Uh, but I don't care about them. They could not actually be there. When I when I watch John Carpenter's then talk about how many people are at the camp, I don't actually think the numbers match up if you count the Americans. So the Americans don't have to be there. They just got caught up in the storm. But when they watch the ice block come in and you hear that music, like they know that this thing should... Sh should have just been left where it was <laughs> the thing that gets me and the thing that annoys me is that once you know that they get transfixed on this alien creature that's frozen in the ice wouldn't you um i think You're... i would be a hell of a lot more interested in the fucking giant ufo that's stuck in the ice i would want to go and explore that thing and you know what would have made a little bit more sense is if they went and explored that ship to try and figure out what's in the ice yeah. instead of going let's just dig up the creature and find out without any kind of protocol but then i guess you wouldn't have had right, the right. film yeah yeah but i was then... gonna, i was going to say so so you just contradicted everything you just said because in this movie what you wanted them to do wouldn't match up with the next movie well the thing is that there's a giant crashed ufo i would like to have explored it yes now, but there's an alien creature it's which, frozen okay you which, can get back to that the alien but yes it's frozen but it could still be alive the ship is inactive and they don't know how to activate it so you just, you're just rooms. gonna go in there and start touching buttons and oh self-destruct mechanism activated oh what, what's that <laughs> Oh, yeah, don't get me wrong, you know, picking up the creature and drilling a massive drill into its side isn't it's such exactly a better the idea, idea, isn't it? <laughs> but I just, I, I was sat there watching them do that drill, and Kate's like, we shouldn't be doing this. We don't know what the effects it's going to have. And I'm well, like, she, no, she was more afraid of, uh, of killing or destroying the remains of the creature. Yeah, yeah, because they feel that, yeah, any outside air might affect it. But, you know, if they take this back to a populated area, it's not going to go down well. <laughs> Sticking the creature with that drill and taking out that sample, that tiny bit of flesh. Which you never see again. Which you never never hear about again or nope. see again. Is more dangerous or just as dangerous as the creature in the ice. This is the way I understand the thing creature. Every tiny little part of it works as a whole. Yes, but that small part of it, you know, there's no brain. There's no it doesn't, consciousness. It doesn't, it's just doesn't, acting it? on an instinct. Those cells. Yeah. Every time you look in the microscope and you see those cells, those cells know what they're doing. They yeah. On a cellular it. level, it knows to replicate. But if it is just the thing and there's nothing additional it, added to it, this thing is going to replicate itself. It's not going to grow in biomass from that size it unless will, it can get onto something. It will. It it will attack any any living organism that come nearby. Yeah. Yeah, this thing can. Is, we only ever see it attack living objects, uh, live, you know, humans or animals. I understand it from the way the books explain it to me that this thing can assimilate any living organism. Yes. If it came, if it was next to a, if it was next to a flower, just sat there in a pot, it could assimilate that flower, because the flower is a living object. It. That's how the book, then we never see it in the films, but no. the books explain it. Like there's, um, in, in John Carpenter's movie, we're supposed to understand that um, 
Childs and Palmer have a weed field that yes. they've been growing up there, and that the thing gets in there and attacks the, and attacks the plants. And they, are, they have to burn all the plants because the plants are alive and so the thing can assimilate it. So that tiny little bit of flesh, we never see again. It's but, very much um, going back to who goes there, yes. which in which case it was a plant monster kind of hybrid. Yeah. And for me, I feel that that part is the part that changes Edward. Edward, played by Trond Espen Siem, um, is the head of the Norwegian camp. And spoilers, he does become the creature at some point, but he's also one of the lead characters that everybody is also trying to rally around and find out what's going on. You know, he's the guy who's just you know, happy that all of his teammates have found this creature, you know, but he's in charge of them and he's got to take care of them. So when Jameson sees that creature escape <laughs> right up through the ceiling and you're like, Part of you is like, I want to see more of it. But part of you doesn't want to either because, well, we know kind of. Our imagination does the rest. You know, we add the extra limbs and eyes and tentacles and spikes and whatever. But Edward is the guy who starts organizing people into groups. We need to go out and we need to search for this thing. Call out if you find it. Maybe it's hurt. Oh, I think it's Halverson who doesn't want to harm it. Halverson, did you not see what it did to the ceiling? That poor ceiling only had three days to go until retirement. <laughs> it ain't a damn joke, man! The freaking thing's alive! And so, yeah, it's not long before they do corner the thing and it lashes out and it yes. spikes a oh. hole right through one of the Norwegians and pulls him in and underneath before it starts consuming him whole yeah which is something we've not really seen the thing do well how, how does it assimilate we now for me don't it can, know. I, because they, they they you know the rest of them turn up and they do flamethrower and and kill the creature yeah. whilst it's doing whatever it is it's doing to this other guy and I have to say the special effects on the hooks or the claws coming out of the shack while it's on fire yeah is it looks dated and horrible. You oh, can just really? tell that it is not, not really there, which is a shame. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and so when good. when they are looking at the the corpse of the thing, they you know they they prize it open, and thankfully it is all a practical effect. Yes. Which will remind you of the John Carpenter, you know, dissection sequences. Yeah. And they can see him in there, and they they, they, they you know the, the doctor theorizes that it's slowly melting him like an acid stomach and yeah, it's absorbing, absorbing him. him or eating him whereas Kate is just like well it seems like it's fresh skin yeah so it looks like it's in the process of replicating him but that can't be the case because that is still him because you saw his legs and body and torso being eaten and it's just his legs sticking out so it's like was the thing taking this person and absorbing him to it you know, increase its biomass to be bigger, or was it taking him in and then was going to replicate him and then, you know, spit him back out as a double, it, and then therefore there'd be two things. Both of those ideas um, are are what the thing does. Yes, but it's like it's hard to see because we've seen the thing it in was, the John Carpenter version assimilate people differently. Well, in both in in the John Carpenter one, it uses tentacles a lot. I mean, it uses tentacles when it attacks the dogs. Uh, it uses the tentacles when it's attacking Bennings. Yeah. Um, Palmer is the first one to actually viciously attack somebody, and he bites Windows on the head. Yeah. Now, the moment he lets Windows alive, Windows uh, lets Windows go. Windows is still alive. Now, but he so, is infected. He is infected. Now, is he uh, healing himself? Is is he starting to heal himself? Does he have any knowledge? We don't know. So. When I see this guy um, get attacked, it's like the thing spikes him because it's alerted. These guys are gonna let you know let people know, and I'm I'm under threat, and it starts to absorb him because that's what it does. But also trying to find out information: where is it? What's going it's on? It's the first human it's encountered as well. Yeah, well, there is a there is another guy at this point who is outside called Griggs, who is part of the American team, and it's kind of speculated he hears the creature. Now you don't know if he has a run in with the creature or not, but if the creature is halfway across the camp in one location, then it's only 
a theory of mine that it might have broken a piece off to deal with him because we also see that Lars's dog has gone missing and there's a massive blood pool in there. Now, the size of this creature underneath this desk wouldn't have left no evidence after attacking the dog unless it's spiked the dog and pulled it through the fence. But then when it's being attacked with the fire, it might have dropped the dog off. Like with um, Norris's body in John Carpenter's, you know how it breaks off yeah. and the head becomes completely separate. We don't know this because the film wisely keeps the same kind of goings with John Carpenter's. It doesn't it doesn't force its explanation onto you or give you a, or give you an explanation that you won't buy. It just gives you all the little bits that you need to get you through the movie to, you know, like, oh, here's the creature. Wow, that looks cool. A lot of the sequences in this film play much like the sequences in John Carpenter's. Which makes it very much a soft remake. <laughs> this this sequence here where they're destroying the, the creature is the dog sequence. You know, the moment they start doing the autopsy, it's the autopsy sequence with, yeah. with, with dog. It is beat for beat identical to, to the John Carpenter film. But at the same time, also coming from a different perspective of, well, let's just do things bigger and badder. Well, yeah, you know, one of the one of the differences between the films is that in John Carpenter's version, you do not see those that would surprise the audience as the thing. Yeah. Whereas in 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 this version, the thing, you know, it's not shy, and it will expose itself a lot more and a lot more yes. aggressively. Yes. Uh, than than it would do later. Now yeah. some. Fans have theorized that you know that this is the creature first learning about humans and how yeah. how capable they are, yeah. and so by the time the thing has gotten to the John Carpenter version, it's a little bit smarter in how it's going to go about that's, its assimilation. That's the view but, I have. But that is it. There is so much you do not know about the thing creature, and yeah. you still don't know after you know three movies, one game, and a book. You know, it's still. A guessing game as to how this creature actually functions and exists, whether the creature is even conscious at all, whether it is just a virus and it is just an instinctive, you know, acting. The different actors that have been in the yeah. different films have different theories themselves as to That's how they're going the to play. That's the beauty of it. Being the thing, whether, you know, whether they are the thing and... They know that the thing, you know, you know, I'm not Gary anymore. I'm just the thing, and no. I'm going to pretend to be Gary. Kate. Or whether I'm still here, and I know I'm the thing, but I'm also still me, and I'm worried that I'm the thing. Kate gives the Kate gives the best explanation in this film, and you know, she basically says that this thing makes a perfect imitation, and then hides inside the imitation yes, yeah. until it's alone with its prey. So or, you might not know threatened. you're the thing. You may not know you're the thing. You may have partial memory loss and be questioning, what was I doing? Where was, where was I doing? But it's made such a perfect imitation of you that nothing can tell the difference. Until that, la until that moment where it what doesn't want to be you anymore it wants to be the thing and it what can it do well i can fucking make spikes come out my arm you know i can make my chest into a mouth hey you know what today i'm going to make my legs become fucking huge 12 inch spider legs and i'm going to scuttle around the ceiling it it that's the beauty of it it can do whatever it can re remake itself into anything that it's ever imitated in its past now there was a, a whole opening to this film which they never actually shot. Right. And that was including having an alien race flying this ship yeah. that was attacked by a thing creature that they'd picked up on a different planet. Yeah. And yeah. it had imitated and broken out and killed all of the crew. And you would have seen in sequences that they had planned for the film where they would have explored the ship and found burnt corpses yeah. and half imitated monstrosities yeah and it was the thing creature that killed the crew which caused the captain to crash the ship into a planet that but at that time would have had no human life on it yeah yeah and so therefore you know obviously not knowing the creature the alien creature then escaped the ship because there was no more biomass for it to consume and froze itself because the creature for whatever reason knew it could survive this long period in the snow but it would have died of natural causes on the ship 
Um, so the alien creature can yeah. die. It can you can starve it, but if it can freeze itself, it will. Yeah, but I mean, it its death has to be on a microscopic well, yeah, I mean, level. How many years was the ship crashed for? 10, All of 000. those things, you know, the on a molecular level, it should have died. Yeah, but yeah. It, it managed to freeze itself, which is you know one of the creature's main strengths. Yeah, I like the introduction of the fact that the creature cannot absorb metal. Yeah, yeah, that that works. And now they needed they needed another stepping stone in the series to keep this film separate from John Carpenter's. You know, as we already said, a lot of the sequences replicated, and it would have been too easy to go, oh, this is just a John Carpenter remake. Having in those extra pieces of metal then allowed. Kate to investigate all of the members at the camp and not have to replicate the blood testing Well, sequence. the characters did come up with the idea of doing the blood test. Yes. But the big creature blood. got to the blood yeah. and destroyed the lab before they could do any of these tests. It's just nice that they, they, they didn't know what to do at first and the only thing that she had were these teeth because she'd found them near the shower something had been attacked like, you have this ridiculously long moment when she finds these fillings, fillings yeah and she's looking at them for ages and you can hear the helicopter you know powering up and she's still looking at these fillings ah. and then she touches her mouth and she's like it's all oh, the fillings it's all suspense build up first time you saw the film Spoilers here. If you haven't seen John Carp uh, if you haven't seen the thing, please stop and go back and watch it. First time you watched the film, who was the thing getting on the helicopter? Um, it it was the the guy who looked injured, the it guy who the got Norwegian. the blood spray yes. on him. Yes, and that was I felt that was really well done because you know I'd seen the trailers. I had I had you know partially w I had wikied it. I kind of knew what was going on, but when I saw it. On the screen, I still I totally forgotten, and I'm like, oh, you're gonna head back to camp. They'll be all fine. And you see that guy rocking back and forth, and I'm like, he's gonna explode in a minute. It's gonna be like <laughs> bits all over the place. It's gonna be awesome. And Kate's like, no, no, they can't leave. We've got to keep them down. I'm like, yeah, you can't fucking let them leave. One of them's not, not human. And then when you see Griggs's face kind of split, now. Yes, I know prosthetics are better than CGI, and I know that some CGI, especially early 2000s CGI, doesn't look as good nowadays because of the better cameras and TV that we've got. But how would they have made that effect look good using the prosthetic effects of John Carpenter's? They needed to use computers. No, they, they didn't they need did. to. They did they, not need to. They did. There was. Um, there was a lack of confidence in the team that were doing the practical effects. And even though I'm going to show you some of the footage now of the behind the scenes of the puppets, animatronics and molds and things that they, they made yeah. were amazing. They look amazing like but that. But they were not confident in the way that they were shooting it, lighting it yes. and making it, making it fit of the scene. Yeah. And so that lack of confidence filtered up to universal higher ups and when the film was finished they turned to the the staff and just went you know what cancel all of the other practical effect shots we're going to cgi the whole lot because you've wasted too much time already doing the practical effects to which they had very little time and the people doing the the cgi effects had an even smaller window to get all of the effects into the film, so much so that the film was delayed like four months and the special effects that were done on the film were finished just two weeks before the film actually went live in cinemas. Wow. Which is a fucking rush job. Good job, guys. Good job. It was a I, rush I, job. I, I thought it was good. And the good CGI job. work in this film is not only a fucking insult oh. to Rob Bottin oh. and John Carpenter oh. from a film in the early 80s which looks better than Yao. Yes. Yes, it does. But that's also a good point. It's a good point because I get enough, like I've already said, I get a sample, a taster. Hey, look what the thing can do. And it's I'm a, like, it's but a I still poor the, imitation. But I, but I still get to watch John Carpenter's movie after this. Yeah, brilliant, because that's got better special effects. Fine, I'll carry on. It, 
it works for what it gives me. It you does know? not because work. The because the crashes. moment you see the CGI, that is the moment. I mean, I already had issues with it when they set fire to it. But looking at it here, the moment is chest opens up and a million tentacles fly out. I was just like, I'm done. You're like, I know that's, that's not there. That's fine. But people have that same view with John Carpenter's movie. People still have, I know people who say, I don't like the special effects in John Carpenter's. It looks fake. And it is. Let's be honest here, people. Let's be honest about special effects in movies. We are just talking about latex and paper mache. We are talking about a couple of computer graphics here and there. For me, if it can work and deliver what I am wanting or needing from the scene to give me, it works for, it works for me. That scene where Griggs's face explodes, I didn't expect him to get out of the helicopter and give me an Oscar winning speech about, you know, the ins and outs of alienness. I just want to see the, I just want to see the helicopter crash and be like, okay, those guys are done. So I'm hoping that the rest of the thing is dead. No, now we've got to deal with Juliet. Now we're all sk staying with the special effects here because Kate has explained to the team that the filling, the, the, the thing has imitated somebody perfectly and it's gotten rid of all the fillings. So anybody with fillings, is human. Anybody without feelings, you have to stand over there. Juliet has her moment with Kate, explaining to Kate that she feels that Colin, the uh, radio guy, is a bit suspicious. Now, Colin doesn't make it any better for himself. That face he has. That face he <laughs> fucking has. And you feel entrusting to Juliet. You know, girl power and all that, let's work together. You know for a fact that Kate is not the thing. But then again, I was actually questioning it all the way through. But the fillings, keep, every time I come back to the fillings, I'm like, yeah, she's human. And she is alone with Juliet for a moment. And Juliet explodes into this creature. I know, as a fan of John Carpenter's movie, this effect is nowhere near as good as the effect of Norris. Um, chopping off the arms of copper and the thing exploding up in the ceiling. But I also know that from John Carpenter's own admission, he was unable to do half of the action-packed scenes that he wanted to because of the problems with the puppetry work and the prosthetics. That's because there's nothing like that had been achieved or done before in cinema. But at the same time, they also try, like you just said, they also tried to apply it to this film. And they themselves were worried that it wouldn't shoot right and the lighting wouldn't work right. The, the special effects guys, not the, not the producers, they heard about it after. The actual guys were looking at it going, I'm not sure about this. I think it but, was down to the fact that they just were not given the prep time that Carpenter's film ended up receiving. But, you, but, to, but even then, this sequence with Juliet, she smashes things out the way. She chases Kate down the corridor. She, her, Juliet's head is still groaning like, Wah! and I'm like, burn this fucking thing, burn it! The, the biggest problem I have other than the CGI effect is the fact that the thing telegraphed I'm transforming now. I'm transforming now. Why would, Take your time turning around, why, Kate. Why, I will go for you once why you realise. Why wouldn't it? That's, we've already, no, no, we've no, already wait, stated wait. that it's... I'm just thinking about Blair when it goes and attacks Gary in John Carpenter. What does it do? It just walks up to him and goes, thing. Uh, right, right. It just face grabs him, starts turning him into the thing. But what But what have we also may, may have said? That this is the first time it's interacted with this kind of organ, with a human organism. So how... It doesn't know how to attack this human organism. You, like you just said, you're talking about, you're talking about Blair getting Gary. Now, the dog sequences, Palmer, um, Copper, all those sequences, this thing has to stay hidden now because every other part of it's dead. In this one, in this one, we still don't know who is hidden. You know, at this point, if the helicopter hadn't gone and hadn't crashed, Griggs and Julia are both the thing. Well, I also have issues with the fact that with the helicopter crashing, that means there's still a thing out there in the wreckage of the helicopter. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And you yeah, also, yeah, there's no, there's no clues. There's no, there's no threads. There's no hidden things 
for you to pick up on to go, yeah, now that person's the thing who would have infected that one, which would have caused this. You don't need you... that. They're all going to die. But that's part <laughs> of the fun of the John Carpenter version is, is seeing the clues that's in the film language that Carpenter has had the time to put there. Right, but you're contradicting yourself now. I, I'm, you're contradicting yourself because are you trying to compare? Do you want this film to be like John Carpenter's The Thing? Well, the or thi do you want it wait to minute, be... This film is trying to be John Carpenter's The Thing. Or do you thing. want it to be separately? Do you want it to separate and be stood on its own? Because I, I'd rather I, I, it be stood on I its own. I need some continuity between the two. And there are just moments that I've just... It just doesn't... does not there. And, yeah. There's continuity. But like I said, for me, there was... I only needed... I only needed like five things. I needed the axe in the wall, yeah, the guy yeah, with yeah. the... Everything else was obsolete, you know? I didn't need them going aboard the alien craft and having to look around. It didn't matter. It's a burnt out wreckage in the next movie. You are looking. You are you are looking for it. I should be. You you you, sh you shouldn't be. When I approach some films like this... That's how I know this is a thing imitation. When I approach films... When I, <laughs> you might know it's imitation. When I approach films, I don't want to hate on it. Until it gives me enough to hate on it. Where after a while it takes a couple of boxes. I'm like, well, fuck you, movie. I wanted this movie. I got like three ticks down going, okay, continuity's off. You've missed that scene. Yeah, okay. But at the same time, I don't care because I just... just I, just I got, care. I've just got to get... To, I've just got to get to the... It's got to get to the end. After they've destroyed Juliet's body and Kate has finally separated the group, the Americans, yes... The Americans make it back. Now, I do have a problem with this. I mean, how they survived in that snow for that long. <laughs> but the body count has to be bigger. And I always do like a big body count. And the Americans are put to the side and held in, in, in kind of jail until they work out what, what to do with everybody. And they escape from their jail cell and knock out Lars. Steal his flamethrower and they head back in and it's a massive confrontation. And the cool thing about this film is we can say as much as we want about the CGI effects, but I do also really like the acting. I really like the cross between the Americans and the Norwegians. You know, the Norwegians talking between each other and the Americans not understanding them. The Americans talking between them, each other and the Norwegians not understanding them. And then you've got people like Halverson who can do both. And it's even more sneaky. And so they're constantly conflicting with each other. The paranoia is sitting and everything's about to kick off and the Americans break into the rec room and there's a big standoff and the Norwegian guy's killed. And his flamethrower pack is um, ignited, explodes, knocks Edward completely out and sends everybody flying. Now, in a bit of a imitation of the blood sequence from John Carpenter's, they take Edward's unconscious corpse into the rec room and he becomes the thing. Now, not only does he become the thing, but his arms break off and jump on Jonas's face, who plays Tormund in Game of Thrones. I, I kind of like that guy. He's got, he's a, got the, one of the best beards beard. in film. Yeah, yeah. one of the yeah. best beards. But at the same time, he's got one of the most harshest death because he's still alive when that thing is... Infecting him. Infecting him. Now, I like to imagine that after a while, that thing would have just absorbed into his whole body. Yeah. And he would have just become a perfect imitation. Yeah. Then. Um, but while he's there, it's still slowly turning him on a very molecular level. Edward himself, though, turns Adam, the other American scientist, and himself into the two-faced man that we know from John Carpenter's The Thing. And I, I in the cinema, I was like, woohoo, yeah, baby, here we go. This is, for me, the most frightening transformation or or thing uh, attacking somebody yeah. because of the face thing because of the way it's it rolls over his face and rolls back across yeah, and, and you can see that the skin's joined now it's just melting I'd, into each you other know, the more times i watch this sequence i'm still horrified by putting myself in that position and yeah having the thing above you and there's literally you know, he's screaming for them to burn it yeah you know to fucking burn me with it like yeah this, this transformation this creature is, is horrifying 
And but I, it, it's the fold of the skin of the cheeks over and then back again. I was like, I'm still looking at it and I'm like, it's serviceable. It, it, yeah, that's it. It's serviceable because all we all we need now is that thing to be outside, melted and burnt. Again, ready I'm just to go going to, to the say, American camp. Look, look at the practical effects that they built for this sequence. And then, you know, at least when they filmed it, the actors had the puppet there that was nice. doing it so that they got to respond to the thing that was happening to them before it was just completely replaced with CGI. This, uh, for me, it, it works because the, the CGI creature works because it gives us the expansion of the camp now. We're not just forced into a couple of rooms. They, they're running all over the place. How, how are they going to fight this thing? This thing is massive. And... I like also the fact that once they get the flamethrower working, they have to, they burn everybody. You know, even Jameson, who only got stabbed in the stomach and the tentacle yeah. came back out, they burn. Because, well, they don't know if he's infected. He, he might, he might Very come slow back. infection, yeah. Yeah, you know, they, they deal with it. But the, the, the two-faced creature also finally attacks Halverson and turns him. And... I questioned this when I was working, watching the review, but thinking of it while you were saying it is, it's the thing has now interacted with enough creatures that it stayed hidden. Halverson's thing wants to get away because now, every a... time the thing has ap has appeared, it has been attacked and destroyed. And as much as this thing is a violent, aggressive, horrifying species, it's still a living organism, and no living organism wants to die. No. And, you know, it, it, it does bring up the theory that maybe the thing just has wanted to escape this entire time. Yes. Now, I say escape. Now, some people, you can deter the fact that maybe the thing wants to build its own UFO spacecraft like Blair or whether it wants to get back in this ship and power up and fly back off into space. Well, or does it want to take itself back into a more populated area and you know, and try and assimilate the entire planet. And I'm like, you know, if the, if I was given, you know, you're thinking about it, it's like, does this alien really want to take over the entire planet or does it just want to go home? I, I tend to believe that the thing actually just wants to go home. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I go with that. It goes to the ship in this one. I mean, we know that it makes a ship in John Carpenter's because this one is destroyed. Yeah. But it starts to get this one active. And to me, it's like it's going to escape. So then for me, it contradicts the it was a specimen held a uh, zoological where i'm like well you know unless it absorbed all the pilots then how would it know how to fly the ship unless it well it was, was the it... captain that crashed the ship yeah to unless, stop the thing but unless the the thing was piloting yeah the craft but then again if it was a specimen how can we feel bad for it when it it might be a, 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 a like a chameleon like species which is very peaceful but these aliens that have held it have forced it to become what we would see an alien covenant, you know, of this organism that they drop on planets to wipe everything out so they can colonize it. And this thing's like, fuck you, man. I've had enough. I'm just going to fucking flash out. And then every living organism it comes across, it's like, well, I don't know what you are. You're attacking me every time. It's not my fault. Why, why don't you like my huge gaping maw? <laughs> you know, <laughs> my blood shredding teeth. You know? <laughs> But after destroying the two, the the, the two faced man and putting the axe in the door, yeah, which was another clap for me in the cinema. Um, Carter and Kate are the last two, and uh, well, Lars is still first. knocked out or been well, we, dispatched of. Yeah, yeah, Lars has been dispatched of. We don't know if he's still alive, um, and we see that Colin is locking himself into what we would know as the radio room. Um, there is a deleted sequence here that I guess they decided was too extreme for a potential PG movie that they were going for. Yeah. And having him commit suicide. You know, you hear that he's locked in the room with the other arm thing that escaped earlier. Right. And he's, you know, worried that, you know, he's locked in this room. The thing's in here with him. And rather than face it, yeah, one wrist, then the throat, and he dies in the chair. And I'm like, okay, so the thing cannot imitate him it cannot infect him it cannot add his biomass to the thing because he's dead there's no brain spark there's no conscious there for it to imitate anymore well unless they bring out another film and do that and, and but i imagine it. they would just be zombies they would be drones because this yeah. what they had imitated was dead 
Yeah. Um, so I, mean, I don't it think that to, it can. It might be able to absorb its bio, the biomass to make itself larger, but then the creature might, unless it desperately needed the biomass, it, yeah. it might just look at it and go, Pff. I mean, because obviously if, it is, if he is locked in the room with the arm thing, the arm thing doesn't attack him. But, but the thing Scott is, we also don't see that arm thing in the rest of the film. So there is well, we, now we see, a thing creature crashed in the helicopter and there is a thing arm actually, that escaped no, no, into no. there. We see one arm go on Tormund's face. Yeah, and the other arm. And the other arm gets oh, chopped gets by the axe. axed on the wall. Okay, and, then, so and, then gets, and then gets destroyed when she burns it with the flame. Okay, so, so it was taken care of. But so there is still the off. thing out in the ice. Yeah, they, yeah, there is, there is the thing out in the ice. <laughs> and the two-faced man outside though, isn't technically dead. But they... Follow Halverson to the alien ship, and for me, this this is where the film trips itself. Well, up. this was all extensive reshoots because the entire ending that they shot for the film or planned for the film was completely changed. This is it because Kate ends up falling into the alien craft, finding her way to the cockpit, and having a fight with Halverson. But while she's making her way to the cockpit. Carter has made his way into the ship and at some point something happens to Carter because after Kate has defeated Halverson with a, I think it's a grenade that Lars had shown her earlier in the yeah, film. Yeah, yeah. She didn't de detonates the grenade and detonates the signal I, as well. There is such a, it's such, it's just such bullshit. This ending <laughs> right, sequence. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not only does the the thing creature look completely CGI. Like completely, and it looks so fake that I, I just, I just, uh, it's, I just, it, in its defense, Blair doesn't look any better. It still looks better than it this. does, but it's very darkly lit in John Carpenter's, and even Carpenter himself has said that he wanted the whole ending to be a lot more action packed, but they couldn't do it. They so, ran out of time, so they just had to have that thing, and so he had to light it in a way. And it, for me, that. Blair's thing looks good, but it just doesn't look good enough. It's Kurt Russell that saves that ending. In this one, yeah, the creature just goes around and just make, it takes me back to Aliens. And I'm like, oh, I could watch Aliens again. <laughs> the thing that also annoys me is that it traps Kate. Yeah. Like into a, like a corner section. An air vent, yeah. An, an air vent. And the thing is just like flailing at her for ages and then it just disappears. I'm like, and it gives Kate enough time to, well, then the creature bursts through the side panel. And I'm like, wait a minute, thing. How, you, do you remember when you can just detach limbs? How easy would it have been for the creature to get her? And it's just like, I can't reach. Oh, I can't extend any further. Right, 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 okay. So he get, so the thing gets her. She doesn't drop the grenade and the ship flies off the end and we don't ever have drunk. How about move. she's being thinged and then she pops the grenade in, in between both of them and store you know the, that would have been a cool it ending. would have been a very that cool ending cool because ending. there's no there's, it's only the writers that have just decided in they this rushed it. reshoot because originally it wasn't that thing creature but it was the thing creature from the original novel that it was inspired from and they wow. actually built the creature with the three eyes and everything oh, and it looks good it actually looks better than this cgi mess yeah halverson's face just doesn't mold very well <laughs> <laughs> But she escapes and comes outside, gets caught up with Carter and they get back to the snowcat as the craft uh, explodes and we're left with the wreckage for the next movie. And as she gets to get into the snowcat with Carter, we notice that his earring is missing. Now, the film had made sure that we saw the earring earlier on, you know, just, just in case you didn't, you're questioning it, you know, he's got a metal thing in his ear. And now it's missing. And I'm like, well, when? By what? When did he get grabbed? It was, you know, uh, from interviews and from what I've gathered, he was already supposed to have been the thing before right. they even go out to the ship. And in the original ending, he turns up with the flamethrower and saves Kate from the thing. Right. Even though he is the thing. And that was his way of going to being able to trick her into believing he was not an imitation oh. and but of course she still detects the, the, the earring. earring is missing yeah well he had it when they were going out okay when, he's, yeah. he's, he's, that's so, what I mean the camera know, focuses I, on it I can only guess that when she is set, well, they are separated they are separated and there's it, just a time dilation the, the time distortion somewhere like I said it's like it, in normal time she's it's knocked like, out like, as well isn't it's she like she's knocked minutes. out yeah. yeah so it could be just like in John Carpenter's 
you know, the extension of time in the Thing movies, you've really got to expand your mind. It may look like five seconds on screen. It's actually supposed to be at least, I don't know, a couple, an of, hour, hours maybe, couple yeah. of hours, you know. So there is this also this other thing to, there's a massive like Tetris ball thing glowing. Yeah. She walks past that. There is actually a CGI effect to cover up the alien captain that had hung itself in the cockpit of that ship. <laughs> <laughs> Which was part of the original, what was originally Why there. Why the fuck did he hang himself? Because it was suicide. They were afraid of the thing imitating them, so they killed themselves. Why did he shoot himself with his laser gun? They, they, he, was hang, he was hung anyway. I mean, did he even have a neck? I mean, how many alien creatures have necks nowadays? I don't know. I bet you he was an engineer. Also, I mean, speaking of the alien, um, it was Alec uh, Gillis and Tom Woodruff Jr. who nice. did the special effects for the film, who of course worked on the alien since Alien 3. And when you first get to the crashed UFO, there is an oddly shaped xenomorph head in the snow. Ah. And so you could be like, ah, oh, that's a little nod to the alien films with this alien yeah, space yeah. UFO. Cool. And so anyway, the sequence when she fo she knows he's the thing and she's like, I'm just going to go put the flamethrower in the back. Yeah. And she brings the flamethrower back out and she's like, yeah, I'm going to kill you now. I was like, oh shit, like... This is the first time they've had the thing creature that's not just been, oh, I've been rumbled, oh, yeah. I'm going to yeah. transform. It was like, no, Kate, please don't do it. And I'm like, wow, have a conversation with the thing. Please have a conversation. No, flamed it. No, because he would have just, he would have just been like, bah! and the thing would have just. She was, pre she could, well, I mean, she could have kept her distance. She could have just kept, no, she had him at the flame front. Man, I love the thing. I'm never have a fucking conversation with it. I would have just loved for the conversation. Unless like, it's been like, six like, like of if glass. you could have been like, you know, yeah. what exactly is your game? Are you trying to assimilate us all? In which case, fuck you. Or, you know, you can try and lie to me. I don't know. Just something. A conversation would have been interesting. It would have ruined the next movie. Yeah, okay. Any, any okay. Extra, but any story extra. going forward, I would just love a conversation with yeah, the thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> story going forward. <laughs> any extra that this film, what, uh, any extra that we expect this film to give us yeah. would have ruined the next movie. So, with what it gave us, even though we're. I mean, it was, it was trapped, we're it not, couldn't do anything yeah. new. But even though we're. Yes, but it was only going to give us what you had before. Even though we're not entirely happy with it. As a fan, I'm happy with it. I have seen worse prequels. I have seen <laughs> worse remakes. This Trivia. one, right? You name another prequel that Joel Edgerton was in? No. Star Wars prequels. Oh, okay. Uncle Owen. Oh yeah, shit. <laughs> Fucking hell. No! But the film ends nicely because Kate gets into the snowcat and it runs out of power. So she's dead. Well, there's. You know? I, I, well, does it run out of power? Well, she's still sat in there. I mean, and. So I've I got we, three ideas as to how the film ends after it ends. Okay. And it's either, yeah, she freezes to death there. Yeah, that's. Or you know, she it. makes it to the Russian base, which was mentioned twice in the film. Okay. Or. She turns up at the American base after she realizes that Lars has disappeared um, and turns up and rescues McCready and Childs. Happy, happy ending. That would, that would, that would be quite <laughs> and cool. And also, that would be quite cool. this film does, maybe unintentionally, but it does, for a fact, tell you that Childs is a human at the end of John Carpenter's The Thing because he's got an earring. Boom shakalaka. Oh, thanks for that. I didn't know that. I didn't, I didn't realize. I never realized he had an earring. Oh my god, mind blown. Oh my god. Oh, love it. But we see Lars come out. The helicopter lands. The music starts to kick in. That boom, boom. Boom, boom. The camp is a fucking wreck. The dog jumps out and runs off into the snow. And the pilot is shot at by Lars. Lars forces the pilot to get inside the helicopter and the two of them fly off and it ends with that <laughs> shot as they're chasing the dog. It, this is just so, you know, it's supposed to lead into it. It does lead it into does, one it of does. the greatest films. Because I'm ready, I'm ready to go. But I'm ready to go. I'm just like, I, I just found myself in hysterics. Why? Because Lars is shooting and missing that dog yeah. at the Norwegian camp. Yeah. They fly all the way to the American camp and he's still shooting the dog. <laughs> Just can't shoot it. Man, 
Ex- ex- exhaustion. Exhaustion. <laughs> he just woke up. Yeah. <laughs> he was knocked out. I mean, knocked out and going to sleep are two different things. But still, I'm, I don't know how much ammo he took with him, but for him to keep missing for miles and miles and miles. Uh. So, favourite scenes for the prequel thing, Ian? I, like I said, I I, I like this movie. My first favourite scene is when the creature breaks out of the ice. Um, Everything just seems so happy. You know, everybody's in the rec room. They're all having a good time. Everything's so positive. They've just discovered a UFO with alien life. (laughs) Alien life. They've just, you're never going to look at the stars the same again. But this is the last time they will be this happy. After this point, people are going to die. The paranoia is going to set in and just... Shit's gonna hit the fan. When you're with that guy, you you're waiting for it to break out. You're waiting for it to break out. You're waiting for him to get attacked. And it's not until what he gets to the door and turns his back that that thing just breaks up into the sky. It breaks up through the hole and it's gone. And you're like, oh my fucking lord. It wasn't very subtle, was it? No. <laughs> uh, my second favorite scene is the group standing in front of the fire at night time, uh, reminiscent of uh, John Carpenter's. It's just a beautiful shot of the snowy cat mountains, the camp, you know, this burning fire of flesh and mess and whatever. It's, you're just, you're just uneasy and you know what else is gonna happen. I think as well, I think as well, even though people hate the CGI effects, I do like the effects of the thing. I've always liked the effects of the thing and what's always bothered me about John Carpenter's movie, as amazing as it is they don't do enough the 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 puppet effects don't do enough you know i want more when you've seen like the xenomorph and the terminator and even the shark from jaws do these great action sequences the 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 thing doesn't it doesn't seem to move it's just a statue seeing juliet smash out of that room and run down the corridor i can i can kind of look past the faults of the cgi you know the 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 two-faced man kind of hunting for them in the corridors. It, uh, even Griggs in that helicopter, what was he thinking? I mean, those tentacles come flying out. Was he gonna tentacle the guys and fly the helicopter at the same time? No, he, he, he realized after what big mistake he'd made. <clears throat> so yeah, there's really only two two memorable and I guess favorite sequences from the film. Okay. And that is the sequence where Kate is, you know, figuring out the blood test and checking the fillings. And yes, I, you know, I don't have any fillings. And so when, you know, at that point, I know that I would be categorized and put in the same group as a potential thing. (laughs) And that terrified me, you know, it's like putting yourself in the situation, which is what great horror films do. And you can put yourself in there. Uh, And the whole figuring it out, of course, that sequence, the tension is built up, but then it's immediately broken when the Americans return uh, from the crashed helicopter, which it's a little bit far throws the suspicion onto them, despite the fact that they are innocent and then they kill an innocent man who suspects them. and, And then the whole blood test thing, it's kind of the whole tension came up and just collapsed before a thing outbreak. And it was just like... At least, the, the, for me, the John Carpenter one built the tension up to a thing outbreak, yeah. whereas this one built the tension up, dropped it, and then had an outbreak. And so it's yeah. it's memorable, but it, it, does, it, it felt like they deliberately missed a beat to not be beat for beat. Yes. The, yeah. A remake. Yes. Uh, but uh, the, the two-faced thing creature, you know, when it's transforming and its clothes are tearing off, its arms are flailing off, yeah. you know, its legs are doing its own thing. And then when the head is tilted back and it's eyeballing him, yeah, like because when the thing breaks itself off into pieces, it's like does it does it have eyes half the time? It, it does you know what's its sensory evolution of it? Yeah. You know we don't know, but this thing is eyeing him, yeah, and that 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 was scary, yeah. The practical effect, you know, when we, we can see what it looked like before the CGI was was put on top of it, yeah. This sequence doesn't bother me too much cgi wise because i think the whole horror of the aspect of it is what's really capturing your imagination for me it's it's always going to be a a travesty that they the studio lost faith in the effects department that they couldn't deliver what rob botine had done the effects department 
also had lost faith in themselves. They were unsure. Yeah, they were. They were. They were on shaky ground, and it is. It is sad that they didn't push. They, you know, they, they. You know, they didn't have Stan Winston and Rob Bottin. Yeah, going, yeah. We can fucking do this. Yeah, they needed that behind them. They yeah. needed that behind. Maybe them. Maybe Neil they, Blokamp. That would have been good. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it, it, for me, it's it's always it's always tarnished and blemished this film that. I will not re-watch this film as much as the Carpenter version. Mm. We've, we've, many people have had the conversation as to name a good prequel. And it's very hard. Yeah. I mean, yeah. can, can you name any others? Well, I mean, I looked up on... I, I was looking for prequels to, to match against this one. And the only one I could actually find that was pretty good on the list was The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. Which I didn't even realise was a, a prequel to... A, a fistful of dollars and a few yeah. dollars more. I, I didn't even realize that, so I don't even count that because it's the third in a trilogy. It, it gets confusing. This is the only one I could actually name personally. This is the only prequel that I go, yeah, it's good. I I, I like the Star Wars movies, um, but there's stuff in there that fucking <laughs> fucking the thing the thing looks down on and goes, really? They did that? That's stupid. Yeah, you know. So I have to hand it to them for. You know, when I walked out of the cinema the first time watching it, I, I called you up, Ian, and I was like, you know what? Everyone is saying how oh, well, you should avoid it. And I'm like, it's not actually that bad. Yeah, and you so know? then I went and watched it. And I have re-watched it quite a few times, but I am at the point now where I'm like, I've reached the point where I don't think I'll ever watch it again. Like, unlike the John Carpenter version, which is a masterpiece. So, you know, this film is, over time, it's, it's going to look, it's going to start looking ropier. I think, and it just it also just doesn't have the joy that I have in rewatching the film and go in in trying to theorize yeah. how the thing got to the next person, when it got to them, how it went down, and caused you know the the things to appear later in the film. The fun of guessing it is not here in this prequel, yeah, and that's because it was a much shorter filming time, less time on everything. They didn't get chance to work those things out and and play with it in the film i mean we are let's take it let's take this as, as truth says the john carpenter's the thing bombed yes it did it absolutely know? did and so maybe that's another reason why it was forced sped up because they were afraid that as putting all this money and all this work and all this hard all this hard time making it look absolutely perfect it could still bomb you know, people immediately are going to people are immediately judging this film on the back of a previous movie. Well, it's you and, know, and without, for good reason because the effects in that film are you know it, within the film. But it's <laughs> un, but it's unfair. You know, we 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 are trying to nowadays live in a society where we try to you know be equality to everybody, but we can't ju you know. But we easily just look at a film and go, oh, that's coming out in six months. It's going to be shit. You know, before the film's even released. But we still go and see it. I personally recommend uh, the 2011 uh, The Thing prequel. But only if you actually intend to watch John Carpenter's film after. Because that is the only way it should be watched. You know, it's it's not bad. If you've never watched, a, you've never watched John Carpenter's The Thing... And you are scared of horror movies. Then watch the prequel. No, fuck no. Don't ever do that to yourself. Don't ever. Dude. If you've never seen either of them, watch the John Carpenter one first. Because no. that... No, because if you see this prequel first, you know too much. And when the characters in the John Carpenter version are trying to figure out what's going on, you can well, be like, boring, seen this before. To, 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 to so truth, don't do that. To tell you the truth, I mean, it doesn't really matter. As Like, like I just said, though... If you have no intention of watching John Carpenter's The Thing film, then don't watch either of them. Because you aren't going to get anything from it. You're not going to enjoy it. But if you are going to watch John Carpenter's The Thing, okay, but you're unsure about it, you're sat on the fence, like a lot of people do. They're unsure. They've heard that this film is really, really good, but something inside them tells them not to watch it. Then watch this Prequel, it will get Only you ready. a thing imitation would watch the you prequel might, first. You might, like Ari said, know too much going into John Carpenter's movie. But the thing is, John Carpenter's movie is so fucking amazing. You don't have to watch this film to watch it. No, you don't. This film's not bad. 
it's not it's it's not bad i'm not going to be around the bush somebody might sit there and comment right now and be like oh ian it's fucking shit it's shit is a shit is a very specific word a lot <laughs> of things are shit but comparatively the, it's not as bad as some of the critics have said it is yes but and, it's it is still disappointing it is still disappointing but it's, but we are talking the prequel to a film that came out in 1982 that bombed at the box office and took 20 odd years to be found and loved by everybody else who didn't see it in the box in the cinema and so the same might happen with this film people might start watching this on dvd going you know what the special effects aren't good as fucking avengers infinity war but you know it's it's pretty scary and i kind of like what it did with this other film you know by this by this director from 1982 with this guy with this big beard because the guy with the big beard is a badass <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter. As long as we get to watch John Carpenter's The Thing. Hell yeah. I think we should go watch that we next. We should go watch that next. <laughs> Thanks for watching Off the Shelf Reviews.